Okay, let me just get myself into the screen. Hello, everyone. It's great to uh, great to have you all here. Uh, I saw the comment. Are we going to start now? I've been waiting behind my screen, so I thought, okay, that's that's my cue. That's my cue to appear to appear uh, in the webinar. We might wait just uh, a few minutes just to make sure uh, that uh, that everyone gets a chance to get online before we get into it, but. Uh, what, when we're while we're waiting for everyone, why don't we? Why don't you let us know in the chat bar there whereabouts in the world you're tuning in from? We are coming at you uh, live from Paris in France here today, but uh, India, Switzerland, awesome. Mexico, great. Wow, we've got a whole lot of places. London, India, Portugal, Stockholm. Oh, another one in France. Bonjour, bienvenue. Deutschland, Germany, Costa Rica. I, uh, I'm from New Zealand originally. I was, uh, I was really hoping that I'd get someone from New Zealand, but to be fair, it's 4, 4 a.m., I think that's even a little bit too early for my mum to tune in. <laughs> so, uh, if my mum's not going to do it, I don't think anyone else will. But uh, we'll see. If you are tuning in from New Zealand and you got up at 4 a.m. to watch this stream, let me know. I'll send you a gift. Uruguay, USA, Brazil, Paris, New Haven, Scotland. Scotland. Someone from where? My name is Mackenzie. I have a very Scottish name, Scottish ancestry. This is awesome. It's great to see. Well, might get just started now before we uh, wait too much longer. So I really want this uh, webinar to be to be uh, full of participation and to, to be as interactive as possible. So it's great to see everyone uh, participating in the chat. So uh, yeah, continue with that. Those that are active in the chat, in the polls, in the questions, will go on the draw to win uh, a swag bag uh, for your participation. We'll announce who that is at the end of the webinar. So ask lots of questions, um, participate in the chat, have some conversations, and you can win uh, a swag bag. So you can look like a very stylish Get Guardian billboard. <laughs> and just uh, quickly to let everyone get familiar with the, the layout of this. Uh, I'll try and answer questions, or Good Guardian team members will try and answer uh, questions from the chat. But if you do have a specific question you ask, you're down the bottom you'll see ask a question uh, and also polls down there. So if you ask us a question in that section, it's more likely that I'll be able to see it and get around to us answering it for you. So yeah, we're watching. I was really thrilled to say we have over 60 countries tuning in today. Well, at least registered. So we might we might lose a few there, but uh, it's great to have so many people uh, from around the world. I'm sure it's morning, evening, and uh, night for different people. So great to uh, great to hear. Italy, we have a new one. I don't think we have anyone from Italy yet. So that's uh, fantastic to see. So uh, we have a couple of polls in here that we will reveal the answers to throughout the presentation. So the first one here is. We're going to be talking a lot about Docker Images, Docker Hub, and finding leaked credentials, leaked secrets within uh, Docker Images. And first of all, I want you to know, under the poll section, let us know what you think. How, what percentage of Docker Images that are public, so ones that you can find on Docker Hub, what percentage of them do you think is going to contain leaked credentials? So API keys and this kind of nature. So let us know, and we'll reveal what is the correct answer as we go through the presentation. So just to start, we're going to cover a fair bit of ground in this webinar. I'm not going to go into great detail about specific topics. There's other videos that I have online if you want to find out more about these. But I do want to keep everyone up to, up to speed so that we have a lot of different people at different uh, levels of understanding. So I'm going to quickly go through what are secrets and what is Docker so everyone kind of can be familiar with what we're talking about. So what are secrets? So 
Secrets are, are typically anything that we don't want public, as the name would suggest. But when we're talking about it in software uh, and programming and software engineering, we generally are talking to digital authentication uh, credentials or certificates. So these are things like API keys. So it might be API keys to your cloud infrastructure, API keys to microservices or SaaS platforms that you're using. It's also credential peers. So credential peers could be username and passwords to systems. It could be username and passwords to your database, which is a really common one. And also things like security certificates and private keys, basically ways to encrypt information and, and, and decrypt it. So these are really highly sensitive. The problem with secrets is that they're made to be used programmatically, which means that we need to distribute them widely. Our developers need these to be able to test systems, uh, they end up in source code frequently, and they become really leaky. But this is important because these are the keys to our kingdom. These are the master keys to the inner working of our application. If these leak, then they can uh, grant access to internal systems, to attackers, and they quite often do leak. So uh, let's talk a little bit about you know, how these, these secrets are used in a modern application. So let's say that we're building from scratch uh, uh, an application, we have a million dollar business idea, we're, we're going to launch this. So we start off building it. First thing we need to do is decide what stack, what tools we're going to use to do this. So let's say it's a Django application. We immediately have Django keys that we need to deal with and manipulate when going through this. We're obviously going to need to make money from our application, so we're going to have credit card processing. Now, we're not insane. We're not going to write this from scratch. We're going to use a service, Stripe, maybe PayPal. We need to have a database, so we're going to use MongoDB. We need to have a search function, so instead of building that, we're going to use Algolia. We need to have uh, great authentication and login services. We'll use Okta for that. And before you know it, your simple application is this collection of different platforms, different services, different providers. Uh, and, that, and this is great because it means we can move quickly and we can build this really secure application, but it means we need to leverage these secrets. Right, and then we need to host our application somewhere. So we haven't talked about infrastructure yet. So we, maybe we're going to host it on AWS. We're going to need to get reporting on this. We need to have our code in a central repository and stored somewhere. Uh, so we're going to use GitHub for this. All of these leverage credentials. Um, even Vault, which is used to store credentials, needs credentials to access it. So we end up with this huge collection. And then once you launch the app, the pesky marketing team's going to want dashboards from Grafana. They're going to want Slack integrations. They're going to want all these different tools so they can see it. And then we haven't even started talking about these custom internal microservices that you're creating, that your app leverages to be able to, to communicate, which also leverage secrets. So <laughs> this is a very simple example, but it should be relatable and how we can end up with hundreds and sometimes even thousands of these different secrets uh, to make our application run. So how do they end up in Docker and other places? Well, you know, commonly secrets sprawl through source code. So they can end up in our Git repository. Maybe they're hard-coded. Maybe they're in history in a version that uh, you've forgotten about. Uh, they can be shared on messaging systems. They can be exposed when we're running our application or when we're distributing it. So th they can be exposed through Docker uh, in this case. And they also backed up and cloned. So imagine all the places your source code ends up. Uh, from creation all the way through to your deployment. It's going to be on multiple machines. It's going to be in cloud drives. It's going to be backed up onto different servers. It's going to be in your internal wikis. It's going to be on your messaging systems. It's going to be everywhere. Uh, so this is collectively what we call secrets brawl. So let's quickly talk about Docker, and I'll move on from secrets uh, now. So uh, what is Docker? Docker can be a, a little bit of a black box. Even those that kind of understand what Docker does, can still be a little bit confused uh, by some of the inner workings of it. So Docker really has three parts to it. So we have our Docker file, our Docker image, and our Docker container. Now, what Docker does simply is it packages together all the inner working components that your application needs to run, and, and when you run it, it runs inside a, a container. So it means that if you're reliant on different databases, different services, then rather than installing them all manually, you can package these together and it makes it much faster, much easier to deploy. The Docker file is really what we use to describe our Docker image. So our Docker image is going to contain our application and it's going to contain other assets that our application needs to run, dependencies. We describe all this in the Docker file. 
when we run our image, it runs within a container. So the, the three elements here, yeah, so Docker file, we describe what our Docker image is, our application that's in there, the different components it needs. When we run that application, it runs within uh, a container, like a virtual, a virtual uh, operating system. So that's, that's what Docker. So let's talk uh, a little bit about the inner workings of Docker. So Docker can be this mystery black box. Um, and you know, it can be this thing where you can even build an image but not really understand exactly what's happening in there or how do we extract files and secrets from this? So I have an example here. And actually what I'll do is I'll, I'll show you a, a working example. It might be a bit easier. Yeah. So this on my screen, uh, let me make this bigger. This on my screen here is inside a Docker image. So where my where you're seeing is highlighting. These are the different layers of a Docker image. So you know how your Git history has different layers to it, where you can go back. So you, when you build an image, it does it in layers. So these are the different layers that we can see. Now what you'll see here, uh, especially in green, over on this side of the page. These are the different files. So we have here a directory called app. You can imagine that the application is running within this. These are all the files that our application needs to run. So even though we've built this Docker image, this mystery black box, there's extractable files in here, there's data. So if we have secrets in our source code, well, our secrets are gonna be in these files in our Docker image. And the next layer here, we've got our dependencies and different. So there's multiple layers of, of, of a Docker image, but it's not just kind of, we can maybe think of Docker as this confiscated and this encrypted kind of mystery box that doesn't really have readable, you know, or re readable files within it, but it's not true. It's essentially, you know, you can almost think of it sometimes as a bit of a zip, you know, like a zip folder that has you know, actual folders that are extractable that are readable within it. So how do our secrets even end up in Docker in the first place? So later on, we're going to talk about what we found in public, uh, public spaces in Docker, so in Docker Hub specifically. But how do these secrets end up in there? So the number one place that secrets that we will continue to find secrets are inside our source code. So this is true for Git repositories, uh, and it's true also for Docker images. So if we have hard-coded credentials in our source code, they're going to end up in our Docker image. If, we, uh, if we're building our Docker image locally, so ideally you probably want to do it from a, from a CI CD pipeline, so it's building it from your Git repository. So that if you have a clean Git repository, you'll hopefully have a clean Docker image. But if we're building it locally, we can kind of forget what, what is extractable on a Docker image and, and and throw things like debug logs or accidentally, you know, or configuration files or environment variable files. These can be wrapped up, packaged in our Docker image, and this is gonna make them be vulnerable and it's gonna expose them to the public. The next place that we can really uh, find some secrets inside our Docker files, inside our kind of images, is within the Docker file itself. So we talked about the different stages. So the Docker file describes your Docker image. And one place that we, we might have secrets in this Docker file itself. So in this example here, what you have is we're going to be pushing this to uh, a package manager, in this case, pip. So we have here uh, a username and a password that that package man manager is going to use to authenticate ourselves so we can push it to there. We could describe these insecurely in our Docker file, uh, and then uh, that package manager will pull these. So let's just say we're sending it through HTTPS re request. We're firing these off, but these are actually hard coded in our Docker file, which means that they will end up in our Docker image and they'll be ext ext extractable. Now that use case doesn't happen a whole lot because <laughs> when you're typing in your secrets into that file, it just feels wrong, well, hopefully. But here's a, here's a use case that we do see. And, uh, and, and it kind of makes sense. You can see why this use case here. So what we have going on here, it's very similar to the last example. We're pushing our Docker image to uh, a package manager, uh, pip again, and we're gonna pass credentials to it so that we can authenticate ourselves with this private package manager. 
So to do this, we're using a netrc file. And essentially what we're saying here is we're going to copy our netrc file, which is going to have our credentials in it. And then we're going to pass these to our package manager. And then at the very last step, we remove the netrcc file. So that we're basically saying we want to grab this file, we want to pass the credentials to, to PIP, and then we don't want this file in our Docker image because it has credentials, so we're going to delete it from the Docker image. So this kind of makes sense, right? You're using the credentials and then you're removing them. But as I said, Docker has layers to it. So even though that we are removing this file on the later stages, it's going to be in previous versions of our Docker image. And as I showed you before, we're going to be able to go back and see these different layers. So we're going to be able to find our credentials and they're going to be exposed. So another way that credentials can end up inside our Docker images. So next, let's, I really want to talk about what is a real world example where credentials have been extracted from a Docker image and then they have been used in an attack that actually happened. So, Earlier this year, you guys probably would have heard that CodeCov, a code coverage tool, was breached, and this affected thousands of different customers that CodeCov was using. Now, at the start, we wasn't sure exactly the extent of this, and the headlines started to come out, and it wasn't until massive companies started reporting that they had been breached as a result. This is what we call a supply chain attack. CodeCov was part of these companies' supply chain. So Rapid7 came out and said that they were affected from this, Monday.com, uh, Twilio, uh, and even HashiCorp, a cybersecurity company, was affected because of this CodeCov breach. So just to quickly explain what CodeCov is and, and how this happened. So CodeCov is a code coverage tool. It sits within your CI uh, pipeline, and it basically checks to see how much of your application you're testing. So if we look at what this looks like is we have our code, we commit it, and then we pass it through to our CI pipeline. And CodeCov is part of this CI pipeline. Now, what's important to know is that this CI pipeline needs to build your application um, and it needs to test it. And to do this, it needs to leverage secrets. So to securely pass these secrets, which is the correct way of doing it, we have these secrets in as environment variables within our CI pipeline. So these may be things like our Git credentials, you know, or, or our, uh, our package manager credentials, like what we did through the examples of the, the Docker file. So these sit as environment variables within our CI pipeline. What these attackers were able to do is that every time CodeCov was run, they dumped all the environment variables that were running on these different companies, 20,000 different uh, customers, and then they sent them to a remote server. They basically sent all the passwords that were in that CR environment to the attackers at their remote address. So pretty scary stuff. How did they do this? Well, they were able to update uh, a bash uploader, a script within CodeCov. And they did this because in the CodeCov's Docker image, they had an exposed Git credential. This gave the attackers access to their Git repositories. They were able to update this bash uploader script. And I think there was a few thousand lines of code in this bash, bash uploader script. And it was just one line, just one line in here that actually just showed uh, that, that, that sending these environment variables, it would be very easy to miss if you didn't know what you're looking for. And it, the change came from a, uh, an authorized person. And then they were able to compromise code cov. And then from that, they were able to gain access to all these Git repositories that these companies were using. So the, the target in this attack was actually private Git repositories. They wanted the Git credentials from that CI environment to be able to go into these private Git repositories. So this here is a real life example that shows that what we're talking about isn't just theoretical. You know, this is an active threat. And Docker can be a blind spot for even large companies that are security focused, because it can be such a mystery, uh, a mystery, and it's, it's not really kind of on the public radar like Git repositories or other elements are. So we have to be uh, we have to be we have to be careful when we're leveraging these credentials inside Docker. Okay, so we have another poll. So down the bottom, you'll see the poll 
the poll tab there. Make sure you post your answers in that. Let me just get this one active. Okay, so I want to know from you guys, do you use Docker Hub? Do you publicly uh, publish your Docker images from your company or from your personal projects? Or do you only use private uh, package manager or private uh, hosts to, to store these? So really interested to hear what you guys are using for that. Now, whilst you're doing that, I'm just going to get uh, Henry, our head of R&D, onto the screen. So give me one second. Okay. All right. <sighs> Squish in. Squish in. <laughs> so welcome, Henry. Welcome to the to the webinar. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Mackenzie, for inviting me. That's all right. You had no choice. <laughs> Move over a little bit more. You're just being cut off there. It's a small square. So why don't you uh, introduce yourself and tell you what your role is here at GigGuardian and how long you've been working here for. Yeah. So I'm Henry. I'm a French engineer and I work at GigGuardian on the uh, research and development team. So my job is mainly to maintain the secret detection engine and find new ways to detect secrets and other places. Okay. And so, yeah, we conducted the research on Docker related. So your, uh, your role here at Gigarian is really focusing on being able to detect secrets in different ways, making sure we're not picking up false positives. Yeah, and also that we're picking up true positives. True positives, yes. What, what are some of the challenging aspects of being able to accurately detect secrets in, in your job? What makes it difficult to be able to determine false positives and uh, true positives? There are many challenges. Um, I think the first one is that there are many different uh, ways to use credentials. Like even in code, you have different languages, you have different types of credentials, like standard API keys that you will use uh, in a HTTP call. Mm -hmm. And you also have like private keys that you will use in a SSH connection, for, for instance. And all the developers will not write their code in the same manner. So that's one problem that one, one challenge that we have. Okay. So we had a poll at the start, as you would have heard. We wanted to know what percentage of images do, do people think that uh, that their Docker images, what percentage of Docker images have secrets in them? I forgot my words there. So do you want to reveal the number? I'm looking at the polls here. Most people think it's 12%. I'm really surprised. That's a, that's a large a large number of uh, Docker images. Yeah, sure. And um, everyone seemed to agree with each other. And what uh, were your thoughts before I told you the, true num the, the truth? Yes, yeah. What did I think? So uh, I was really surprised at the number. I thought it was going to be on the lower end. I thought it was going to be about 1%, 2% uh, of, of Docker images. The reason being is that uh, you know this is an advanced technology. It's at the end of a of, of a development process. Uh, this isn't something that our students that are starting off are going to be leveraging a lot of. Uh, so you know when you talk about Git repositories and stuff, we find a lot of secrets from uh, Django keys from the first project or, or, the, or this type of thing. So uh, I was surprised. I was surprised when you told me. Yeah. So actually, the number is seven percent of the seven percent. So I'm su I'm surprised. Uh, Twelve percent was the was the one, but I guess it shows. <laughs> I guess we, we, we knew it was going to be a bigger number than 3%. So we weren't going to depict that. So I guess 12 is probably the, the obvious answer to pick there. But uh, congratulations to anyone that picked 7%. Uh, but yeah. There are right now eight of 8 million publicly available Docker images on Docker Hub. So you take you know 7% of over 8 million. Well, we get to quite a lot, about 750,000 uh, images uh, are potentially vulnerable from this. But why don't we move on to talking about the experiment that you guys conducted that's specifically related to Docker images and how much secrets you found within these. And let's start by maybe walking us through what you did, what the experiment was. Yeah, so the experiment was taking some random images from uh, Docker Hub. Uh, so we used the public images. And once we gathered those images, we tried to split those into layers and inspect the files that were in them, as you explained before, mm -hmm. and then run our secret scanner on that. Okay, and what were some of the challenges that you guys faced in terms of Docker images? So you have been scanning, and Gigani has been scanning Git repositories for a long time. 
how are Docker images different? And what are some of the technical challenges in trying to scan Docker images for secrets? Well, the first challenge was to pull those images because the API from Docker is not made for that. I mean, it's meant to be pulled with Docker, but not with code, mm -hmm. like manipulating it. So that was the first uh, challenge we had. And then we had the issue that, as you shown, showed, um, Docker images have a lot of other files that are not the app, like exactly the app. There are some uh, files used uh, for uh, authentication, but those are not files from the developers. They are standard files that are used by all the images. And we had to filter those out because the scan would have been too long mm -hmm. and we may have had more false positives. Right. So when you're talking about that, when we broke down the Docker image, we could see that there was a lot of files that related to the dependencies that they needed to run. For instance, a Python app will have Python uh, within there uh, and different areas of uh, different files that are standard. Are these the, the files that you're talking about and you yeah. didn't want to scan these? Yeah, we didn't want to scan those because it would have been time consuming for files that we know wouldn't contain secrets added by the user. Right, okay. So let's have a look here. I'll post it up on the screen now. So how many Docker images, uh, what was, like, you know, how much data did you scan during this, during this uh, experiment? So for this experiment, we took two terabytes of data. Um, so we thought it was enough to find <laughs> a lot of secrets. <laughs> two, and we were right. Yeah. And of that two terabytes, 7% of the Docker images in there contain secrets. So what we have on the screen right now, uh, that you'll, my screen's over here, that's why I'm doing this. Uh, but uh, what you'll see on your screen in front of you right now is a, a list of the different types of secrets that we found. And there's two columns here. You'll see one is kind of saying, what percentage, uh, you know, what percentage were found in public Docker images and the percentage found in public Git repositories. So we're comparing these. So if you don't know, Git Guardian scans all public Git repositories. Every commit that you make, we'll scan it for secrets. And we're comparing this against the Docker images uh, so that we can have, uh, you know, just get some, some more information. And the results are quite interesting. So what I'll point out, Henry, is that on our screen, we see the fields for other and private keys, uh, specifically private keys, are way higher than what we find in public Git repositories. Why, what, what, let's start off with saying, what are these categories? People that don't know. And then we'll look into why are these found in Docker images so much? Yeah, so first the, the category other, uh, as it may explain by its name, it's everything that is not in the other categories. But to be more precise, uh, it's mainly or generic detectors. Okay. So these are detectors for which we cannot infer the, the provider. Like let's say it's an API key, but it's not a Google API key. And we know that, but we don't know for which service this API key is for. And, and would that be because of internal services that are being yeah. run? So you have these microservices that you're creating as a company, you're leveraging secrets to be able to communicate with these, but it's not a public provider of a service or a SaaS platform. Yeah, exactly. And this is what we found is that there are many more internal services exposed in Docker images than in public Git repositories. And so this is why we have so many uh, other category uh, secrets. And private keys, is that similar sort of category? Private keys, are what are they used for? Yeah, so private keys are used for authentication, uh, like SSH, so mainly on an infrastructure uh, level. Mm -hmm. So we expected those to be uh, in a higher percentage in Docker images because these are more related to uh, infrastructure than code. Okay. And if we look through all the rest of the results, what we'll see is that in every category uh, from then on, for so development tools, data storage, cloud providers, version control providers, we find way less secrets inside a Docker image. So this can be explained because are there less secrets exposed in the source code of Docker images and more that relate to the infrastructure that are exposed in different layers? of a Docker image? Yeah, um, sort of. Sort of, okay. Uh, in fact, there are less secrets because there is less diversity, like less new users, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. that pushes uh, public Docker images. 
So the level of kind of competency that we get to once we've like reached this reached building Docker images is more advanced. So therefore, we're more security focused. But then why? How does that then explain that uh, we find all these other types of keys in, in here that relate to infrastructure? Is there is there a blind spot in how we understand security and, and what these Docker images do? Yeah, sure. I think there is a blind spot in uh, for Docker security because it's at the um, it's between the development teams and the teams in charge of production and in charge of the infrastructure. And so I think some parts are not monitored by any of the team. Right. Okay. So where is this area? It's this mystery box. Do you think that there is a lack of understanding about what Docker does, which doesn't yeah, help this? Definitely. And should developers learn more about Docker or do we need to invest in training in other areas, do you think? I think we should invest in security first. Okay. And yeah, the Docker area is a really important uh, field because of what I said before, like it's a blind spot. Um, and also we should, like developers and security teams should learn to use as many tools as they can. Like too many tools is not a final problem. Right, okay. Well, there, there, there we go. It can be overwhelming as a developer to, to learn all these different things, but I think it's important. One thing that I think I like to stress in, uh, in my advocacy role is that you don't need to become an expert in everything. You don't need to become a security expert as a developer. You don't need to become an infrastructure expert as a developer, but you need to understand it. And you need to be able to communicate with other team members uh, about this. So it's good to have a, a wide range of knowledge. And I think security knowledge in particular is one that's like, very highly valued. So there. Well, thanks for that. What I want to do is I want to pass it over to you guys here. We have some questions. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, oh, here's a good one here that relates to false positives. But if you have a question, ask us in the questions and answers section, or uh, you can post them in the chat. So the first one we hit is how do you make sure that these weren't false positives? How do you make sure it's not random high entropy strings? High entropy fee is just a mumble jumble of numbers. That's what an API key looks like. How can we be sure of that? Uh, uh, so there are two ways of doing that. First, we know the precision of our tool uh, because it's the same secret scanner as we used in secrets uh, in, uh, in uh, Git code. Mm -hmm. And the second one is by manual inspection. Like we spent quite a lot of time looking at the secrets, ensuring they were not false positives. With, with our Git scanner, I'm going to put you on the spot here too. Sorry about that. But with our, with our Git scanner, we have all this information. We, we, we refactor this into our algorithms to make sure that we're capturing uh, true positives. Because the Docker images are different, uh, is there, will, will, in order, and you said there's a manual process. In order to remove that manual process in the future, do we then need to uh, continuously scan? Do we need to build this up? Or is it closely related to, to get the, the Git repository so we can build both together? Uh, we should be able to build both together. In fact, our secret detection engine can work on anything as long as it's text. OK. So if the base image, this is another good one. Yeah, that's right. if the base image is exposed to a secret, uh, it's counted as two different images with the vulnerability, or it just so if the base image is used, uh, used to have an exposed secret, is it counted as two different images with vulnerabilities, the base and my image, or just the one? So this kind of relates back to what we'll say we scan and what we don't scan. Yeah, and in fact, that's a good question. During our experiment, um, we used some cache to avoid scanning twice the same layer. In fact, each layer has an, I, I, as an ID <laughs> so that we can know if we already scan uh, a layer. So your base image was one layer of your image. So we did, if we had already scanned this layer once, we didn't scan it twice. Okay, so I want to use an example here. Let's say that there is, uh, your base image is Python. Yeah. You've got a Python app. Because you've already scanned the Python Docker image, do we need to rescan it or do you ignore that because you've scanned that image ID before? During our experiment, we didn't scan it again. Okay, scan it once, got it. Yeah, and but uh, in the GG shield, but I don't want to spoil the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the <laughs> next part, we would scan also the, the 
base make. Okay, so in the next part, so the pair. So we'll uh, we'll move on here into the to the next image. I'll wait a little bit longer just to see if there's any other uh, questions that you have here. I'll check the chat uh, to make sure there's no other. But last opportunity to send a message to Henri before he moves off screen. Uh, so please fire them away now. I'll, I'll give you guys a few minutes uh, to work on that. Well, not a few minutes, a few seconds. You don't have long. But while we're waiting for that, Henry, why, how long have you been at, uh, at Guardian for? I've been there for a bit more than two years now, and the journey is amazing. What's been, so how, let's talk about what you did. How many secrets did we detect when you arrived, and how many secrets did we detect now? Uh, we don't count that much in uh, secrets we find because it's highly dependent on uh, uh, what people scan and what people publish. Uh, we look a lot at the number of type of secrets that we can detect. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I arrived, it was like 150, and now we just reached uh, 300 yesterday. 300. A great achievement. 300 different types of secrets that are detected now. So I think that's great. So uh, I can't see another question in the uh, question and answers, Henry. So but thanks so much for joining us. and. What we're going to do now is I'm going to show you some of the technology that was used to scan images. I'm going to show you how you can recreate this experiment in Docker Hub to find secrets and also to help protect your secrets. So, Henry, thank you so much. Thank okay. you, Mike. No problem. <laughs> okay. okay. I won't readjust the camera. I'll just be a little bit zoomed out. Okay, so let's talk about how we scan our Docker images. So uh, GitGuardian has uh, an open source CLI tool. Uh, it's called GGShield. And we can use this to scan uh, a bunch of different areas. So we can use GGShield to set up a pre-commit Git hook. So if you want to scan your Git commits before they enter your repository and block them if they contain a secret, we can do this. We can scan file directories. And now we can scan Docker images, which is really quite cool. So in order to do this, you just need to download GGShield. GGShield uses the GitGuardian uh, detection engine. Uh, to do this, it needs an API key. So you need to sign up for GitGuardian. But once you have that, you can just run the command GGShield scan Docker and then the image name. And I'll show you very quickly what this looks like here. Uh, okay, so I wanted to use an actual uh, publicly available Docker image. I wanted to use one that didn't have any active secrets, but uh, had secrets that triggered our detection engine. So uh, I found this one here during my experiments, and I'm just going to show you what happens. So I'm running the command, and because this image isn't saved locally on my machine, it's going to download it. So it's just going to take uh, a little bit of time to do that. And then what this is going to do is it's going to scan every layer of this image. So in the experiment, because we're scanning so much information, we would uh, ignore base images uh, that we've already scanned. But in this time, uh, we're actually going to scan everything within this image. So this here has now uh, scanned through the image, and it's came back with some results. And this is what it's going to look like. Now, these are uh, not true positives. so. Just, uh, <laughs> I'm not exposing anyone's secrets. But this lets us know where, what file the secrets has been exposed. So this means that we can go back and remediate this. And what's really cool is that I have this in my terminal uh, right now, but we can put this within our CI CD pipeline. We can scan images uh, once, uh, once we've built them immediately. So this can be part of the process. So if you wanna make sure that your Docker images don't expose any secrets, then we can actually scan them uh, during during this process automatically using GG Shield. And I'll ask uh, someone from GitGuardian if you could post the link to the GG Shield GitHub uh, page. This has all the documents and information about how to install GG Shield and how to use it. Uh, that will be great to do it. And just quickly, because I didn't mention it before, and I do the tool that I use to explore uh, that to explore the Docker image is one called Dive. Uh, oh. 
Uh, so this here, and so if you want to be able to explore your own Docker images and be able to go into them, so I'm right now I'm looking in the Docker image for GG Shield, but that's what this tool here is called. So if you want to be able to do that and look at that too, uh, I think it's I think it's an awesome tool uh, that you guys can use. Again, that's open source uh, for that, so uh, a great resource. Just if you're curious about that. All right, so let's have a look at our poll results now. So what we had. I asked here, did we have images public, uh, published publicly or only privately? And I'm actually really curious. Most of the people here only have private images, uh, about 57%. And this is a, a really interesting argument because it's the same argument that we have about public and private Git repositories. So we know that we find secrets inside public Git repositories. But what about our private repositories? Well, these are just filled with secrets and there can be a, a security pinch point because it has very weak authentication for such sensitive information. And the fact that we have a lot of developers and a large company that have access to the Git repository, the code's scanned and cloned onto different areas. And we may provide access to this Git repository to clients, to service uh, that are working with us on the projects. And the same is true for private Docker images. So just because you're not publicly releasing your Docker images uh, on, uh, on Docker Hub or any other public platform doesn't mean that uh, we can't, that we don't have any security threats there. These Docker images are shared kind of widely. All developers in the company have access to these. They would be cloned onto and installed onto different machines locally. So we still have a large security threat here. So I like to just make this argument and bring it up here that uh, it's not just public Docker images that we need to be uh, worried about, it's also private ones. And actually, I'm really surprised at the amount of private Docker images uh, that, that, that remain here. So that's uh, quite a cool, a cool statistic that you guys have shared. Now, uh, we're coming to the end of this uh, and I, I really hope you guys uh, took some value out of uh, this webinar. But I also want to mention that uh, Docker images can pose different kinds of security threats. These aren't just related to uh, exposed credentials and secrets. There's lots of ways that we can build Docker images that create uh, insecure, that create uh, kind of vulnerabilities within our applications or vulnerabilities within uh, our systems. So we actually created uh, a cheat sheet this year on how to securely build Docker images. Uh, so we talk about secrets in here, of course, but we also talk about different ways and different areas of what to do and what not to do. Uh, so again, I'll ask someone from the from the Git Guardian team uh, to post the uh, post the blog article to this cheat sheet so that people can access that. Uh, that will be good because there's different ways that you can uh, secure your Docker images beyond just credentials inside them. All right, so I've had my elves uh, monitoring the chats and the polls, and I think now is the time to announce who is the winner of the uh, Git Guardian swag bag. So uh, we'll give it uh, a few moments, and can someone from the Oh, there we are. We have me. <laughs> I like that. Uh, so can someone from the Git Guardian team please comment on here who is going to be the winner of the Git Guardian swag bag for participating in, uh, in uh, the, the questions and, uh, and the webinar as a whole. We'll give this a few minutes. But in the meantime, uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning into this webinar. Uh, and uh, please let us know, you can follow uh, Git Guardian. This is our first webinar. So we're really excited to, to launch this, but we're gonna be doing these every month. Uh, so, and we're gonna have different guests on from different companies. We're gonna be talking about lots of different topics uh, around security and also around development in general. So please uh, let us know uh, what you thought about this and uh, reach out to us on Twitter uh, if you liked it. And if you have any ideas for us, we always love to hear from you guys that are our users and uh, people that are following us. So please, please do that. Drum roll. So 
that link that link here that bitly link is to the cheat sheet for anyone <laughs> as anyone was wondering i was uh i was expecting that do we have the winner do we have the winner We're adding suspense here to find out the winner of the swag bag. I think what we'll do is uh, we'll reach out. Uh, we have the we have the list of attendants here. So I think the guys are just trying to find out uh, a crunch numbers of who was the who are, who are the highest. Oh, there we are. We have a winner, Robin. Robin, if you can reach out to us at Geek Guardian, uh, you can reach out to me at Mackenzie. I'll type in my email here. So Robin, if you could email me here. Uh, yeah, great to see that you're there. Uh, I'll get your contact address and I'll ship off that mystery box to you. So again, I wanted to thank everyone here for tuning in. Uh, I had a lot of fun and uh, please reach out to us and follow us. You can follow us on Crowdcast as well if you want to be alerted for each time that we're doing a webinar and of course on all the other social medias. So thanks guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and look forward to seeing you next time.